Hi, I'm David Stein of Money for the Rest of Us. And in this video, we're going to look at what percentage of your wealth should you invest in the stock market. And it's based on an episode that we did last month on Money for the Rest of Us. It was episode 451, How Much Should You Invest in the Stock Market? The Art of Position Sizing in a Volatile Market. And that should give you a little bit of a clue in terms of more volatile markets or when a particular asset is more volatile, we potentially want to put less money in it. And we're going to share a formula that was developed by Robert C. Merton, who is a Nobel Prize winner. And this formula is called the Merton Share, and it's a statistical formula. And I'll share a spreadsheet, and I'll provide access to that spreadsheet. So you can calculate this formula on your own in terms of sort of guiding how much you should invest in riskier assets like stocks. Now, the impetus for this episode was a book that I read called The Missing Billionaires. It's by Victor Hagani and James White. I read it last month, and it's a fascinating book. It, it's sort of part memoir talking about Victor Hagani's experience as one of the co-founders of Long-Term Capital Management, which was a hedge fund that essentially blew up in the mid-1990s. It, they took too much leverage, and there were a number of Nobel laureates that were involved in this hedge fund, including Robert Merton. Now, think of the irony there. Here's a hedge fund founded by Nobel laureates, among others, including Victor Hagani, that took too much risk and blew up. And yet one of those, those founders, one of those hedge fund managers, this Nobel laureate, had a formula that he had developed to figure out well, how much should we put in stocks so that we don't take too much risk. And now, the reason why this is so important is a concept called volatility drag. And in the book, and they go through this exercise of flipping a coin, which you can, you can read the book or listen to the podcast. I'll go into more detail there. But the idea that if, for example, if you got heads, you get a 50% return. And if you got tails, you got a 50% loss. What happens through a series of time, if let's say you had $100, you, you, you flip the coin, it was heads, you got a 50% win, now you have $150. But then you flip tails and you lose 50%, you're down to $75. So you're, you're, not, you're not back to $100. And the reason why there's so many missing billionaires, because he went back to, the, the authors went back to the early 1900s, looked at, well, who, who was a millionaire? And had they compounded their assets over time, there should have been tens of thousands of billionaires in the U.S., but there's not. And they believe it's because they either spent too much money or they probably took too much risk. And the reason they took too much risk is this principle is that through time, what matters is not the expected return. It isn't even so much the volatility. It's the experience that we have, the going through time and how the compounding and the fact that there's this volatility drag, that same gain, either positive 50%, lose 50%. If you, if you do that over time, you will eventually run out of money because you actually have to earn more than 50% to, to make up for the losses. And that's just a function of the mathematics. And, and so based on th this volatility drag formula, they, they came up, or Bert Merton came up with this Merton share to, to sort of figure, figure it out. Now let's take a look at the formula itself. We'll go over here and find me not in the screen. There we go, because I want to show you this formula. This is from ChatGPT. This is the, the Merton share formula. I use ChatGPT for all the time. You can, you can see some of the, the, the searches I've done on ChatGPT. We're actually going to talk about that in episode 457 of the podcast. But you can ask it a formula. Now, so here's the formula for the, the Merton share. And let me go over here and, and fix the screen so you can actually see me. So the formula is they look at the 
expect a re real return. So in this case, the, the market return, let's say for stocks, we have the risk-free rate, and then that's divided by this risk preference times the variance, which is a measure of risk for the, the particular risky asset. So a variance would be the square of the standard deviation. Now you look at the formula, maybe your eyes go a little fuzzy, but if we look at actually implementing the formula, and I'll show you the spreadsheet, how it works so we can capture some principles of that. So let's go over here and find the right screen. So this is the formula that we just showed put in a spreadsheet. Essentially, you have the, the real return, and then it's divided by the, the risk as measured by variance times the risk aversion. And I'll talk a little bit more about risk aversion here in a minute, but let's just assume we look at asset camp, for example, this is our tool for estimating returns. So we have the all country world index, which is global stocks, US stocks. This is the current dividend yield, which we'll assume in terms of sort of a, a building blocks approach, plus the earnings growth. And this is based on the average five year earnings growth and then valuation adjustments. Actually, let's just assume that the PE ratios stay the same for stocks. So, so here's an expected 10 year return for stocks, 6.7% for global stocks, 7.7% for US stocks. Let's put that in our formula. Let's assume that we believe stocks are going to return 7.8%. And the risk free rate right now is let's assume that it's 2.5%. So this would be the risk-free rate risk on, for example, 30-year treasury bonds. So here's our stock market expect return. Here's our risk-free rate. The standard deviation, this is the historical standard deviation for the stock market. It's about 18%. And standard deviation really measures the range of the return. How much is the upside? How much is the downside historically? So how, how often, for example, do stocks deviate from that expected return of 7.8%. If something deviates more, it will have a higher standard deviation. We're going to assume a risk aversion of two, and then the formula spits out the wealth percentage that should be put in that riskier assets in the case of stocks. Now, again, that's based on this formula over here that, that Merton developed. So if we assume, for example, going back over to asset camp, a lower expected return. So let's assume let, let's assume six percent return is our expectation for stocks. And we'll put that in there. And you can see that the, the wealth percentage is 54 percent. Lower allocation to wealth because the real expected return, the difference between the riskier assets and the risk free rate, is narrower, and that's a lower allocation to wealth. Now, if the, let's say, the risk or the, the yield on treasury bills, for example, goes up to, to 4%, and then we have a, an even lower allocation to stocks. Or if the, let's go back up and assume an 8% return. Let's say the, the, it's a riskier asset. So maybe private equity or, or commodities or something like that, that has, let's say, a 25% volatility. Again, the percentage of wealth would drop. And then if our risk aversion, if we are more risk averse, willing to take less risk, then the wealth percentage would fall even more. Or if we're willing to take more risk, in this case, the risk aversion is a one a 64% allocation to the risk or assets. So, so the principles are and then I'll talk about risk aversion, is the higher the expected return relative to the risk-free rate, the more that should be allocated to stocks. And let me get back over so you can see me. And the, the higher the, the volatility, the, the lower the allocation to stocks. 
and the, the greater the, the risk aversion, the, the lower the allocation to stocks. So how did they come up with the risk aversion? Because when I read the book, it, it was sort of, wow, gosh, that, that seems a little complicated. It's just a number. But in, they, they do a survey, and they, and they find that most people are a three based on surveying clients. And the way that they, they measured that is they looked at, well, how much upside is required if you had a portfolio of a million dollars? How much would you need on the upside to lose 10%? And then the people would answer how much, and then it got put in one of these five boxes. Second question is how much upside would you need? How much of a gain would you need if, if on the downside you lost 20%? And then the third question was how much downside would you be willing to accept for to be able to multiply, multiply your wealth five times? And, and they've surveyed hundreds of people, and, and they've realized that most people are a three when it comes to the Merton share formula. So with this spreadsheet, and, I, and I'll include a link at, at the bottom of this video so you can access this spreadsheet. It's, it's a Google sheet. Please make a copy of it instead of, of um, just so you have your own copy. But this formula, if we just assume that we, we use a risk aversion of three down here, which is kind of what they find most people are, and in this case, we had the 25% the standard deviation, lower percent. But the, the, the point of the, the whole exercise is not that there is a right answer. What the point is, is to, to understand the principles, to, to kind of use the spreadsheet to realize, oh, well, the risk-free rate right now, I can earn more in tips than I've been able to earn in Treasury Inflation Protection Securities in 15 years. And, and given the risk-free rate is higher and the U.S. stock market is, is expensive, then maybe I should have a lower allocation to, to stocks than I would otherwise. Or when the expected return for stocks, let's say stocks are super cheap and so the expected return is higher, we would have a higher allocation to, to the stock market. And, and their firm, Victor Hagani's firm, Elm Capital is sort of based on dynamically adjusting the allocation to the stock market or other riskier assets and putting more in stocks or, or more in the risk-free asset based on this Merton share and based on these inputs. Now, it, it's sort of how we've done it at Money for the Rest of Us, a little more intuitively. We're not using a formula, but we're, we're looking at market conditions, the market temperature. And in an environment like today where the, the, we have a higher risk-free rate, we've, we've done a number of episodes about having more in, in tips, for example, or other or more in bonds because of the, the upside of, of stocks as an SI, or maybe they're the same, but because we can earn more on a risk-free basis, then that is, would justify it. And now <laughs> there's a formula to do it. So... Check out the spreadsheet, put any questions below in the comments, uh, subscribe to the channel if you want. We'll be posting videos typically once a week. You can check out the episode of the podcast where we talk a, more, a little more in detail uh, of this. It's episode 451 of Money for the Rest of Us. We'd invite you to, to join our email list. There's a link below to join our email list where we'll introduce an essay on money investing in the economy and what's going on with the channel as well as with the podcast. So thanks for listening. That's how much to invest in the stock market.